Say goodbye to color guesswork and hello to color perfection. In Webflow, you can now search for a particular color swatch and also preview it before applying. You can now take your website from mundane to magnificent by sprinkling dot lottie animations anywhere you please. And for all the design enthusiasts out there, you now have the ability to add outlines or borders to your text, allowing you to style and customize your typography to your heart's content. And those were just a few of the teeny tiny but oh so mighty Webflow updates from the first half of 2023. I'm Adi for Envato Tuts Plus and in this video we'll be exploring the most important ones. First, we'll talk about some exciting workspace improvements and then we'll dive into typography changes, which include some changes to variable fonts and the magic of text stroke. The Webflow designer got a lot of improvements and a few new things as well. So we'll be uh, talking about a nifty new element called QuickStack. We'll uncover some new viewport units and some handy new shortcuts that will speed up your design workflow. Finally, there are some noteworthy enhancements made to the Figma plugin. So we'll briefly cover those as well. And before we get into all that good stuff, let me quickly share a very valuable resource with you. Envato Elements offers all the creative digital assets you need under one subscription. Customize your project today by adding unique photos, fonts, graphics, and themes. For more information, check out the links in the video description. All right then, let's start with the workspace improvements. Before we start with the workspace improvements, uh, here's a quick reminder that you can find more Webflow related content on the Envato Tuts Plus YouTube channel. So make sure to also hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. All right, so let's see what we got. In Webflow, you now have the ability to set uh, one of your workspaces as the default. So here we are in the dashboard. And to set a workspace as the default, you will need to open up the settings for that workspace. And right here, you can toggle this on. And now that workspace is your default. So every time you log in and you open up that dashboard, uh, this is the workspace that's going to be selected for you. Pretty cool. Another great change is that uh, in Webflow, you can now remove yourself from a workspace without having to wait for someone else to do it for you. So to do that, you would go to manage workspaces. And right here, if you are part of multiple workspaces, you would have an option uh, to leave that workspace. Now currently, uh, I don't have multiple workspaces, but I can show this to you uh, by looking at the Webflow uh, official documentation. Right, as you can see, this is the list of workspaces right here, and you can click the three dots and leave the workspace. So this is uh, a new addition, and it solves the problem that a lot of people had where they had to wait for an admin or, uh, you know, the owner of that uh, workspace to uh, remove them. But now it's much, much simpler. And finally, the last change related to workspaces is that you can change your workspace profile URL. So again, you would go into your workspace settings. And right here, this is now editable, right? So you can select this, and you can say, I don't know, uh, Tuts demo, let's see if that's available. And it is. So now my workspace is called Tuts demo. Pretty cool. All right, let's dive into the captivating world of typography. And we've got a dynamic duo on the agenda today, uh, text stroke styling and variable fonts. So let's kick things off with a much awaited feature. And that is the ability to add outlines or borders to your text. Let's take a look at this hero area. We have this uh, big title here, this heading. And instead of having the text filled, let's create a different effect. Let's add a border to it. Now you can do that very easily in Webflow by going to the typography section and going under more type options, you might need to expand this. And here you're going to see stroke. 
So let's add a two pixel stroke. And by the way, you can, of course, change the measurement unit here, but let's go with two pixels. Now, to make this work, you need to set the color of the text to transparent. And by default, that transparency will cascade down to the stroke. So to show the stroke, the border, uh, all you need to do is change its color. And that's it. And you can put like any color you want, anything that works with your project here. And that's it. You can now style the text stroke in Webflow. And let's actually make this a little bit bigger. And we can increase the stroke as well. Awesome. Now for our next features, we're talking about variable fonts. Uh, recently, Webflow introduced support for variable fonts, which is great. And now with this uh, latest round of updates, uh, we can now work even easier with a variable fonts. First of all, let's install one. And I'm going to be using this one, Romella from Envato Elements. Uh, you can find a link to it down below. So to install a font, you would go to the site settings, and you would go to fonts, and you would hit upload custom font, and you would choose the font that you want to upload. In my case, it's the variable Romella style normal upload. That's great. Okay, so now we can go back to our designer. And now that font will be available for us to use. So let's uh, talk about some of the changes that were implemented. First of all, you can more easily identify which fonts are static and which are variable, thanks to this indicator right here. Right, so you can see under Romella variable, we can see just a tiny dot that when you hover on it, it says variable font. Pretty cool. So you can now select that. And you'll now notice that the variation controls have been moved out of this toggle, the more type options, and it's been moved like right here, just at the uh, bottom of the typography panel. So you can now use uh, the slider to change the variation, like the weight, the slant, whatever that uh, variable font supports, which is great. Another change that uh, you might have noticed here is that custom fonts and Google fonts have now been uh, separated. They're categorized differently here in the font selector, right? So any font that you upload yourself is uh, now going to sit under custom fonts and all the Google fonts will be sitting under their own respective category. So now designers will um, more easily determine uh, what fonts they added versus, uh, you know, what fonts were there by default at the start of the project. So this is another new addition uh, for, uh, for the first half of 2023. And the final change related to variable fonts is that you can now animate the custom axes of a variable font, right? Whatever that is, uh, slant, weight, width, whatever. Uh, previously, you could only modify the registered axes, right? But now any, anything you have here can be animated. So to give you an example, let's say I want to create an interaction, right? And change the weight of this as I'm moving my mouse cursor around this text, right? So what we can do is we can select this text, we can uh, go right here to uh, interactions, oops, I meant here. And we are going to create a page trigger when mouse is moving in the viewport. We're going to select play mouse animation, and we're going to create an animation. So when we click here on the zero, we can now choose a font variation. Great. And it's going to affect the selected element, this text. Okay, here you can choose uh, like the easing and stuff. And I'm going to choose the weight, I'm going to say, okay, go from the lowest weight possible. And when I get to the end here, I'm going to set the largest 
weight possible. Okay, so if we do a live preview, you'll see that that changes as I'm moving my mouse left and right in the page. Okay, so we can save that. And now when we go into preview mode, right, we can see that change happening in real time, which is fantastic. And you can, uh, you know, do interactions like these and affect all of the axes of a variable font. Awesome. It seems that in these past few months, the Webflow uh, designer got the most amount of love. So let's have a look at all the, uh, the additions and the improvements. And we start with a brand spanking new element called QuickStack. So to see this new element in action, let's go to the add panel here. And here it is, it's even says new. And uh, it's called QuickStack, right? And let's drag one here. And right off the bat, you can see that um, Webflow gives us the option to select a few presets, right? So we can choose between uh, one, two, three, or four columns, or uh, we can do something like this with multiple rows and uh, different uh, column widths. And you can even choose how many columns, how many rows you want. So this is very, very customizable right from the start. Now, what exactly is this quick stack? element. Well, it's basically a grid that comes pre populated with divs that are set to flexbox. And these divs are called cells, as you can see here, and they are set to flexbox. That's all it is really. And of course, after the fact, uh, you can, of course, edit this grid like you would any other grid in uh, in Webflow, you can you know, add columns, you can delete columns, you can add rows, you can do all sorts of things. But QuickStack basically makes it a lot easier for you, right? It saves you time uh, when building, uh, let's say, common websites, uh, website layouts by starting with, uh, with a list of presets like, uh, like you saw. But just the fact that it comes pre-populated with uh, you know, divs, and they're already named for you, and they're already set to flex. It's nothing that uh, you can't do yourself, but QuickStack saves you time. So for example, if I wanted to create this, uh, this header here, right? How would we do that? Well, really easily with QuickStack, let's uh, drag one here, we need two columns. Yes. So in the first column, we're gonna grab this, paste it in, grab this, paste it in. And then here, we're going to grab this, paste it in. And let's uh, set the alignment to the bottom. And of course, we can change the uh, the size of these, or we can leave them half and half. And then we can go and increase the gap here to like 30 pixels or 60 pixels, whatever, right. So it's really easy to create a layout like this uh, with the new quick stack element. But here's the cool part. If you're gonna select a quick stack element after you create it, you now have the option to edit that from the inspector here from the style panel, right? You can increase the number of columns and that's gonna automatically create the new cell for you. Or you can increase the number of rows, you can change the gap, you can change the rows, right? Uh, if you're going to use a simple grid element, and by the way, the grid element has been moved to the other section right here. So it's still in Webflow, but it has been moved further down. So if you're going to uh, drag, you know, one of these grids here, right, when you select it, you don't really have access uh, to the to the properties in the style panel, you have to go into edit mode, and then, you know, change the gap, the direction, and, uh, you know, change the columns and the rows. But uh, with uh, with quick stack, yeah, you have these options right here in the style panel. And another uh, added benefit is that uh, this is a responsive element. So if I decide, okay, on mobile landscape, I want this to be a single column, I can do that very easily, right. So now, we basically go from this 
right? The two column, we go from two column to one column. So it's really, really easy to, uh, to create responsive components with QuickStack. Next up, let's talk about animations, more specifically Lottie or dot .lottie animations. If you don't know, dot .lottie files are basically After Effects or Adobe After Effects animations, but for the web. It's a, a special kind of format that you can use. And, um, you know, you can find a lot of, uh, of these files on LottieFiles.com. Here's an example. This is a search icon animation. And let's say I want to bring this into my website here, right at the bottom, because I have this, uh, this uh, CTA section here. And I would like to replace this boring static icon with an animated one. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to download this file. So go ahead and download it as a dot Lottie. So now that's downloaded, and we can go ahead and add it to our project. So we're going to go to the uh, assets panel. And um, due to browser limitations, you're currently not able to just drag and drop a .lottie file into your assets. However, you can uh, just upload it and find it and click open. So now you have that animation, you can even see a preview of it in your assets panel. And then you can just drag it right into your project. So let's press uh, J to go to the assets panel, click and drag. Let's put it like right here. It doesn't really matter. So here we can see the duration, how many frames it has. We can even preview it. Great. We can set it to loop so it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, we can choose how to render it as an SVG or a canvas. Okay. And we can get rid of this icon. And now when we click preview, yeah, you'll see that Lottie animation playing endlessly instead of the static one, which is a really fantastic that yeah, you can now use uh, dot Lottie files in Webflow. Next up, we have a change related to colors, more specifically to color swatches. So if you select an element, let's say this uh, text block here, right, and you scroll down, you'll see that it uses the swatch called violet slash base. But here's the cool stuff. Here's the new behavior. You can now click here and you can search for a specific value. So let's say I want a neutral, right? And that's going to give me all the neutral values. Or maybe I want like an orange. If we have a color swatch called orange, that's going to give us all the results. And here's the other addition, you can now hover over each swatch and see a live preview before selecting it, right? So I can see, okay, maybe this orange doesn't really work for me. Um, let's search for maybe do we have a red? Okay, so the red works uh, pretty well. So let's use the red base. So you click, you select, and now that's uh, that swatch is applied to your element. Next up, let's talk about CSS viewport units. So as you might know, in CSS, we have certain viewport units, for example, viewport width, viewport height, which are relative to the size of the viewport. It's like the area that we see in our browser. All right. So for example, if I select this header, and I go to, uh, to here to the width to the size panel, I can set the width to 100 uh, v, VW, right? And that's viewport width. And as you can see, we have uh, a lot of um, viewport related dimensions here, viewport width, viewport height, small viewport width, small viewport height. And we also have dynamic. Now dynamic is a measurement used specifically for browsers that use dynamic toolbars. And I wanted to show you this on, um, on an iOS browser, but I don't have a simulator here on Windows. So instead, uh, let me just show you this image from um, from the Webflow official website. So what happens is certain browsers have this dynamic toolbar on mobile, right? And that dynamic toolbar will basically expand or collapse when you scroll up and down the page. Now, if you were to use 
a traditional VH measurement. That's going to be 100% of the viewport height. And that's going to go from here all the way to here, right? It's going to actually ignore that dynamic toolbar. And that can cause certain elements to be obscured by the dynamic toolbar. But when you use a unit like DVH or dynamic viewport height, that's going to account for the dynamic toolbar. So the height is going to be from here up to here. And again, I apologize, I cannot demonstrate this on an actual, um, you know, mobile device. So you can see these dynamic toolbars in action. But I think you get the picture. So uh, dynamic toolbars are now supported in a web flow. Uh, you know, we have SVH, S, uh, SVW, SVH. And we also have uh, if I select the section, for example, I can set it to DVH. Right? And that's going to have the measurement unit of DVH or DVW, we even have that. So we now have uh, a height of 100 dynamic viewport height. So that's supported. Um, great news for anyone who had issues with these uh, dynamic toolbars on uh, mobile browsers. Next up, let's talk about some new shortcuts. And these shortcuts are here to help you wrap elements in div or link blocks. So previously, if you wanted to group two elements, right, let's say we had uh, these two paragraphs, uh, right, and you wanted to set them in, uh, in a div. Okay, what you need to do is you need to go here, you need to uh, grab a div block, right, and you would need to paste it here and then drag that element into the div block. And if that didn't work, you would need to drag it like this in the layer list, right? And do the same for this. So it was a bit of a hassle, right? But now what you can do is you can right click an element and you can wrap it directly in a div block or in a link block. And we also have some keyboard shortcuts for this. So Control Alt G, Control Alt A. When you click here, it's automatically going to wrap it in a div block. So you can now duplicate that. And it's much, much easier than before. And speaking of keyboard shortcuts, we have some new ones that are designed to help you move elements around a lot easier. So previously, if you wanted to move an element, and I mean move its position within its parent, you would need to use your mouse and you would need to use the navigator here. So let's say I wanted uh, this content. Now let me just make this a little bit bigger. Let's say I wanted this content to be under the subheading wrap, right? I would just click and drag or click and drag again. But now you have some new keyboard shortcuts to help you with that. So if you want to move an element before the previous element, you would use the left square bracket like this, or command down on a Mac or control down on Windows. And vice versa, if you wanted to move an element after the previous element, you would use square bracket right, or command or control up like this. But as you can see, if you're going to do this, these two shortcuts don't take their parents into account, right? They just move all over the place, you can, uh, you know, you can go through the entire hierarchy like this. If you wanted to move within the same parent, then you would need to use command left square bracket, or command left on a Mac, or control left on Windows. So I'm on Windows. So I can use control and left or right to move within the same parent, right? As you can see, I cannot go outside of my parent. So this is great. And then finally, you also have some new keyboard shortcuts for moving elements before and after or after the parent element. And that's uh, command shift up or down on a Mac or control shift up or down on Windows. So now it's going to be much easier for you to rearrange your layers by using some new keyboard shortcuts. 
Next up, we have some usability updates to components. So now, if you have a component, like for example, this navigation, right, you can now double click to edit the main component, right, you can double click anywhere on the component, and it's going to open up the edit mode for the main component. All right, so if, if for example, I want to duplicate this, uh, this nav link, I can say hello, right, that's going to update it here. But also it's going to update it in all the other pages that are using this navigation component. And I can do again, the same here, I can uh, delete the nav link. And now that's, uh, that change is made everywhere else. And something else that's new regarding components, you can now edit component properties on canvas. So for example, we have this, uh, this banner here, right? So let's go in uh, edit mode, let's select this text. And we'll go here to the settings and where it says the the actual text, right, we can uh, create and connect a new property. So let's create that. And now we can go to property settings and we can actually set a default text. That's awesome. So now, if we go to, let's say another page, let's go to oops, I meant this, uh, let's go to the blog, I don't know. And here, I can actually change this directly on the canvas. And I can say this is the new banner text for the blog. Right. So notice that I didn't enter edit mode for the banner itself, I just edited this property. So that's really cool. This will now be just shown on the blog, while the rest of the pages will still display the old text. Fantastic. And for the final change here for the designer, you'll notice that any new section element that you create will correctly use the section tag instead of the WF section, which was there before. Now it's using the uh, the nice semantic section tag in Webflow, which is again, a welcomed addition. So uh, if you're using an older template like this one that uses just a div, you can now change that to uh, to a section and make your code a little bit more semantic. And last but certainly not least, let's shine the spotlight on the Figma to Webflow plugin, which has received its uh, fair share of enhancements. And um, just in case you missed it here on the channel, we have a 30 minute video that goes into detail about how to use said plugin to bring your uh, Figma design into Webflow in just a few clicks. And you'll find a link to that in the video description. Now, let's see what's new with this plugin. And the first novelty is an improved class pasting behavior, right? So let's actually select this and um, let's copy it to Webflow, right? So I just selected the entire page. And I have a, a new brand new website here. And I just paste that in. Great. Now, previously, copying and pasting from Figma to Webflow, uh, duplicated classes, right? So if you had a button class like this, already in Webflow, and in Figma, you had something that was also called button, and you'd copy that over, it would duplicate the class. And very soon, it would uh, really create just uh, just a big mess here in uh, in your class list. But now you have the option for copying these classes without duplicating them. And here's how you can do that you can use some special uh, shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts. So to demonstrate this, let's, um, I don't know, let's go to this button here, right? It's called form button. So it, it has a class of form button, right? But let's actually duplicate this in uh, Figma and change its fill color from this yellow to, I don't know, this, this kind of bluish color. Now it's still called form button. So it's going to retain its, uh, its name. So now when we copy it to Webflow, 
and we go down here and we paste it. Yeah, let's paste using the Webflow classes, right? So I'm going to press Command Shift V on Windows or Command Shift V on a Mac. So Control Shift V. Okay. And even though what I copied was blue from Figma, it's yellow in Webflow. Why is that? Because it retained the Webflow class and the Webflow class is using yellow. Okay. Now on the flip side, let's uh, undo this. If we're going to paste to update the Webflow classes, you'll see a different behavior. So the shortcut for that is Command Option V on a Mac or Control Alt V on Windows. So Control Alt V and that pastes the blue button and it updates the Webflow class. So now the Webflow class shows blue as well, right? It changes the previous button as well. So let's undo that. And now if I'm just going to use a command V, like a normal paste, that's going to show me both options. But now I'm going to have a duplicate class. I'm going to have form button two, right? So this is the, the enhancement that was made to the Figma plugin, you can now choose how to paste those classes. You can either choose to use the, the existing Webflow classes, or you can paste by updating the Webflow classes, or you can just paste normally, and that will uh, duplicate classes. This was actually the old behavior, right? So that's pretty cool. And that's the improved class pasting behavior. Now, the second uh, feature I want to draw your attention to when it comes to the Figma plugin is combo class support. So you can now create combo classes in Figma, and they're going to be brought over to Webflow. And here's how you do that. Let's say you go here and um, let's use the same button since we have it selected. And let's uh, rename this to I don't know, main button, and you would do a space, a slash, a space again, and then you would add your combo class. Okay, so now if you copy this to Webflow, and you go back and you paste that in, okay, you'll see that now this element has a class of main button and primary. So it automatically created a combo class for us, which is great. This is Again, something that you have to or you can uh, keep in mind when you're bringing your design over from Figma to Webflow. All right, and those are some of the uh, most important additions and improvements made to Webflow in these past six months. I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, hey, question for you, which one of these new features, additions is your favorite? drop a comment down below. As always, don't forget to check out the Envato Tuts Plus YouTube channel for more content like this, but also to learn about web design, web development, and a whole lot more. It's all free, so make sure to also hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. I'm Adi, and until next time, take care.